the cold here is something else I really was not prepared for. Coming straight from an Australian summer where we've had a drop of about 50 degrees or so to get here. We hopped out of the car on the first day and the helicopter pilot told us that it was minus 26 degrees. And Harry and I just looked at each other with wide eyes and uh, were not feeling the best, thinking, what have we got ourselves into here? I'll see the tail's full. Well, before this trip, I think the coldest temperature I'd ever been in was about minus five or minus six. So I'm really struggling with the cold, I have to say. Hi, Jason. How are you doing, Claire? I'm good. My feet are cold, so I'm going to start moving. They're going to chop her up the small batteries. OK, yeah. Beacon, is it turn on? Oh, yeah. Equally, I'm unbelievably impressed with the Canadian cavers, the way they they are uh, just so tough and um, driven and they just uh, keep going and going and going. They're very, very impressive. But me, not so much. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> Castle Guard Cave is the longest cave in Canada. It's on the north boundary of Banff National Park. You ski over the Saskatchewan Glacier and across the Castle Guard Meadows, and then the cave itself is running underneath Columbia Glacier. The ski is about 21 kilometers. And it usually takes about eight hours, but very dependent on snow conditions. If it's white out conditions or if you have to break trail through a meter of snow, it could take you two days. It's 800 meters elevation gain, and uh, most of that is really gradual on the Saskatchewan Glacier. So we're blaming this entire trip on a guy called Jason Levine, um, who uh, is one of these local crazy Canadians. And we were lucky enough to stay with Jason 18 months ago when we came to meet Tom Crisp here and do some cave diving. That's fucking beautiful. Jason started talking about Castle Guard, which I'd kind of heard about before, but didn't quite realise what an amazing and massive uh, cave it is. And then when you start to talk to other people like Rick Stanton and other people about this cave, they all go, oh yeah, you know, that's a serious quest. And when we found out there's a sump there that has been dived to its uh, terminus, but uh, no one had explored the dry cave beyond, I guess that's when the idea of coming here for this trip uh, started. Just in the entrance of Castle Guard Cave, and um, it's taken about 21 kilometres to ski tour to get here from the car. Team one skied in the first day with a few supplies just to come in and make sure the, the cave entrance was open. They got here and found that the, uh, the ice crawls, which is the lowest part of the cave that potentially freezes shut and basically determined that there was airflow through it and we could get through, it just might take a little bit of digging. The rest of us came in the day after. When the morning's negative 20, everything fucking freezes. There is a big moraine to go up, which is kind of dealing with avalanche hazard or you're into this kind of bare windblown slope that's partially frozen, partially not. Three of us started out uh, overseas and flew into Calgary, where we met up with the, the Alberta Speleological Society. Craig and Harry chop it in with all the dive gear. Had I known quite how much dry caving and how difficult the dry caving was to get to the sump in the first place, I think I would have paid a little more attention to my fitness, which I think is partly contributing to my uh, current state of disintegration in this cold weather. But I haven't given up quite yet. Um, hopefully tomorrow I'll feel a bit better.
About 1,200 pounds was helicoptered in. Soften the line, generator, petrol for the generator, all the batteries. So it's just you know, like that dive gear and all the tanks. Ended up with two helicopter loads. So I think one loads a thousand pounds and then the other one was 200. And then that's how they decided that the divers would go up because there was all that excess capacity available. We had the next day to basically work on the ice crawls and the dry cables were absolutely phenomenal at that. They had the chainsaw down there having a whale of a time chomping the ice away and um, getting the hatchets out and they managed to make a nice big channel um, for us fatter people to fit through. Um, so now we can actually get through and get all the dive gear um, actually out to the sun. What do you say? It's going to be so much work for so many people yeah. doing so many laps. If these boys are struggling, I'm fucked. You having a break? I'm having a break, yeah. Oh, I don't blame you, mate. You've probably been working hard chopping down trees. Oh, yeah. <sighs> What's going on up there? I'm still too fat to fit through. Oh. Um, I could use a couple more lines right at the last eight inches, maybe. All right. So the others have met and um, cleared on through, have they? Yeah. Well, pretty easy to get through. Yeah. Those boys did some serious is work on there. Yeah. Yeah, this one did great. I got through both ways, no problem. Oh, good on you, man. Watch out, big fella. Here I come. Your ass looks so good in that seat. Thanks, bro. That place up there wears on you. It's uncomfortable. The camp. The camp. Yeah. Once you get down in here, it's much better. Yeah. These gloves are the duck's guts. Oh, no kidding, eh? Yeah. And prostate exams. You know, I'm only an amateur. Oh, yeah. I'll give her a go. <laughs> Nothing to lose. How amazing is it looking down at the rocks and the river bit? Just follow the channel, it's going to meander back and forth. Yeah. I'm going to be just in front of you. So That's good. At whatever distance. All right, buddy, let's get her out. The tight uh, chest bit here. Uh, not bad, just wriggle a little bit. Oh, so yesterday. Thank you, ladies. The sun is beautiful. We hide Oh, really? It. I didn't think I had a chance in hell, but these boys have been cutting a trench for 48 hours solid. Chainsaws, picks, shovels, whatever. It's been varying between minus 10 and minus 15. Once you become accustomed to life in the sleeping bag, it really seems like a very inviting place to stay and you're not particularly keen to get up and get out of it in the morning. I'm not kidding. There is more toilet paper in Castlegard Cave than in Canmore and Calgary combined. Last night I went to bed about, oh, I'd say 9.30, 10 o'clock and I think it was 9 o'clock this morning when I got up. So it's a particularly disgraceful performance, but I am not the worst on this trip. 19 on the campsite, it's not easy to get your shoes on. So we're ready for a dive today. So we got about a kilometre further after this, and we should be at the water. We spent two days sawing a section out with a chainsaw. It's about negative 20 outside, and everything's frozen. It then starts getting very low, kind of almost bedding plane-ish type passage where it's a lot more crawling and groveling with your pack and it just carries on that way and carries on that way and carries on that way and it's just, it's absolutely crawling trying to get gear up to the sump. There's a few other little rock squeezes on the way which are uh, kind of entertaining because you kind of roll your bag out in front of you and then you, you squeeze through and then follow it down. 
and all the floor is just sharp kind of bouldery rocks so your, your knees take an absolute pounding so do your elbows you're um crawling on rocks so you're just like planting your knees and hands and then you just move the tank you know kind of inch by inch we're gonna be like millionaires <laughs> you already are buddy you're rich in spirit well i think we're going pretty well this is early stage in the big foray to the other side of the sun and we're making pretty good time through the dry section so i think we'll be maximum two hours here um, which is a pretty handy schedule. It'd be great if we can get this day over in 10 hours or so. Eventually you, you pop out towards the sump and it just opens up so you can actually stand up. There's a good platform there that we can gear up on. This sump? Oh, that sounds like a great plan. It's going to be an awful lot of footage of your ass, Gray. Well, lucky it's such an attractive ass. I reckon we've probably got another half hour left to the actual sump. Yeah. Um, should hopefully open up a little bit after this, but you know, we've just had a good while on our knees and sharp rocks and those two little squeezes, and then uh, yeah, hopefully it gets a little bit nicer from here on out. And once we get to the actual sump itself, there's, there's some nice area that we can actually stand and uh, get a bit more comfortable. The sump itself is a fissure that drops down to the water and seems to carry on out um, towards the, the back wall. And you can see just this huge shaft descending. From Martin Groves reports, should go down to about 20 meters before we then pop out into more phreatic passage, which slowly starts coming back up to the surface after roughly a kilometer of underwater section. Uh, this is a beautiful dive, absolutely stunning. It takes about 50 minutes to, to swim from uh, one side to the other. Uh, just big, big passage, you drop down the 20 metre shaft. And then we, we broke out into the clear water as soon as we hit the um, horizontal going passage and it just slowly kind of creeps its way back up from 20 metres up until the, the surface on the other side. So the dive itself was really pleasant. I was actually surprised that the line that's been laid in there quite some years ago is still in really good shape. When Martin put that through, he did a pretty good job. It's, it quite securely laid but because we've been told that the floods go through this sump I expected that it would be ripped apart and we'd have multiple line repairs to do um, it was only as it turns out broken in two places um, and the first place it had obviously been chafing on a rock and gradually worn through so yeah, there was a bit of slack in the line, managed to pull the ends together and tie them together. It was broken in another place as well and we uh, jumped past that pretty quickly. As a result of that, we really have some doubt about whether the, the flood that uh, floods this cave, the, the bulk of the water comes through this sump, because I would have expected after all these years and that amount of flow every season, that the shape the line was in would be a lot worse than this. The current theory uh, of where the water comes from may need to be revised on that basis. Yeah, there's, there's really not a lot of evidence of um, big floodwaters coming out through that um, sump passage. I mean, when you, where you get geared up, there's a, there's a clay bank up there which looks like it's 
uh, there's been water that drips on top of it and it basically runs downwards. Whereas if the, the sump was actually flooding, what it would do is it, it would push out in the opposite direction and smooth out all of that clay. But there doesn't seem to be any evidence of that. And even the, the far side of the sump as well. There's a small little stream that kind of trickles into it. Uh, but again, there's no real sign of huge floodwaters that come through there. There's not really any scalloping on the walls or, or anything like that. So on the far side of the sump, the information that we had uh, previously from Martin Groves was that the sump surfaced and there was quite an open area, easy to get out of the water and that there was tunnel leading off from that. So we were very excited about this and that was our chief objective of this whole trip was to explore that tunnel. So we hopped out of the water, um, there's a very nice little pool there that's really easy to work in. Um, you can help each other get de-kitted and, and geared up. What we could see from there was this really nice walking passage about two metres high and probably three metres wide. I headed up there first for just a little bit of an explore. Unfortunately, after about 30 metres, it narrows down to this uh, rift passage. I proceeded up that, but it was really getting a little bit uh, hairy to go up there in a dry suit because I was very concerned about tearing the dry suit or damaging it somehow, sitting down on a sharp bit of rock. And so abandoned that, came back to where Tom was and we started a survey just with the idea of surveying as far as we could uh, reasonably, just to get an idea of what direction it's heading in. Uh, it's certainly heading straight and my impression is uh, it's going upwards a bit as well. Um, there was a little tiny stream flowing in the bottom. so. Definitely water flows down here, but as we mentioned before, there's some doubt because of the formations that are in there, um, some pretty fragile formations, whether the full flood comes through there. So we surveyed up there about 60 metres or so, and then we thought, well, it's really a little bit dangerous here because if we do tear a dry suit, then we're in all sorts of trouble for the trip out. So we turned around and headed home. We ended up surveying only about 60 metres of passage before we decided it was probably a bit too gnarly to be doing in dry suits. Happy to be back this side of the sump and uh, still leaving big open passage on the other side ready to go back to and uh, take some proper caving gear for. I think 16 people called and participated on this trip. There was probably five people supporting us down below. There's years when you just can't access it. It just seals right off. This year it didn't seal right off, but it was narrow. You're trying to arrange with all these volunteer people to come and work for free. So you're trying to offer them a rewarding experience. Need little stabiliser wheels. Yeah, little outriggers. Outriggers, yeah. yeah. Just the way dates lined up, had to go farther out of the caving community to try and find people, but um, I think we pulled together a super awesome team. In the hindsight, with the helicopter, we could have used the wall tent, but then it's really hard to get people going in the morning. Like, they, nobody wants to leave the tent. Isn't Mount Castle Guard over there? Yeah. Well, that's a bit of an effort if they go and ski that. 
These guys are crazy. Castle Guard's been known about for a long time. Cave exploration started in earnest in the 60s there. It was a McMaster University group that did car studies. All the research that we have on the cave is from that group. We're at the top of the moraine, about to go down onto the Saskatchewan Glacier. We saw a nice little avalanche across the other side. So uh, we'll keep our heads down, I think is the only thing we can do. But conditions are absolutely perfect. Probably perfect for avalanches as well. Tom Crisp is about to launch himself down that thing. Which in my opinion is a very unwise thing to do. I'm worried that I'm skiing on snowshoes. Very wise, very wise approach. The sump lead was sitting there for 10 years prior. Like, it's an awesome lead, but it's so challenging logistically. That's a long way down. It's probably unorthodox, but seems to be working. The low hanging fruit was picked, and then you go to the medium hanging fruit, and then the high hanging fruit, and then there's the stuff that's just not really sure if it's worthwhile. Oh, don't worry about us. We're professionals. So we're walking down the Saskatchewan Glacier now and about five hours into the walk from Castle Guard Cave and looking around me at this scenery I'm starting to think this might just be the most spectacular thing I've ever done in my life. I have to say the time inside the cave has been pretty tough so to be out here in the outdoors and just basically tramping in this amazing place all makes it pretty worthwhile. That's Tom with his new technique. I keep walking over things that sound hollow. It doesn't feel good. I feel like we're at the beach. Nice. Right. Nice. I think it is a small group of people who have the, the passion to put in the hard yards. There's plenty of people around the world who'd be capable, but you know, lining up all the things that made this successful, including permits, the ice crawls, uh, the climate, all the things that had to fall into place to make this what is actually a relatively straightforward dive, uh, to make that possible, it's, it's actually an enormous undertaking. And um, I'm not unhappy with the result, to be honest. I think. The fact that we established that there is cave continuing beyond that sump is, is a significant achievement. I love all of you people, but I didn't buy the best co uh, cut of meat for you. It's the cheap shit, so we have to cook it more carefully. Okay. And you'll eat it what fucking. You you'll eat it medium rare like a man. What did you have to do to become part of the wet mules? I'd rather not talk about it. <laughs> mm. This is for the inevitable investigation that's to follow. I'm well, sure. there will be fatalities. Yep. <laughs> it became clear during the barbecue well, when people started to perish yeah. Yeah. Well, I from when I was there, various I types of injuries, <laughs> including alcohol poisoning, <laughs> uh, barbecue burns, <laughs> uh, salt and pepper seasoning, <laughs> and other various maladies. We were looking at that the other day there, like where it changes from that rifty passage into the subway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like... <laughs> and My animal husbandry is definitely laughing. Record? Start again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How confident are you it was a bat? Well, I know my bat shit. I think that was the story, wasn't it?